Museum of Ireland, archaeology has a huge collection of objects from our past, but why are these so important? In this film we look at the arrival of Christianity in Ireland and show how these objects can tell us about the impact Christianity had on the people who lived here and the changes it brought to Ireland. There are many different religions in Ireland today and there were many different religions in the past and we know this from objects like this one and this has three faces. It's a three-faced Celtic god. It's associated with the Celtic god Lu and it comes from Corlick in County Cavan. Um, this is the time, I suppose, that we would associate with the Celts. Yeah, and of course this is around the time when the great stories around ancient Irish heroes like Cúchulainn were based, um, which are often centred in ancient Irish sites like Awan Maca. And the Loch Nishay trumpet was discovered nearby, not far from Navan Fort at Loch Nishayd or the Lake of the Treasures. Many objects were found at that ceremonial site. Yeah, with the, with the really distinctive artwork on the, on, the, on the bottom of it. And then a little bit later, you have the Romans. And of course, the Romans never invaded Ireland but we have evidence for contact um, from the earliest stage. And then in the fourth to fifth century, we see things like the Beline Horde, which are chopped up bits of silver plate, which were being paid probably by Roman Britons to Irish kings to stop them raiding parts of their shoreline. And we know at this time then they're coming into contact with the early Christians and early Christian people are then traveling to Ireland. So it's like if you saw your sister in your jumper, you'd know, ah, she's been in my bedroom and borrowed it. And it's the same thing with the evidence of the Roman hordes here. We know there was contact between Ireland and the Romans by the objects that we find here. Exactly. That's kind of like, that's what the role of the archaeologist or the historian is. It's like a detective piecing things together. And you can see that kind of continuation and borrowing then, as you mentioned, the designs on the horn are very like the designs on a stone from Mullamast in County Kildare, which comes from the 6th century and isn't that far from Glendalough. And Christianity had a huge impact on Ireland and the lives of people here. And you can see that through the different objects that we have here in the museum. So we're going to take a look now and see how life changed for people in Ireland because of Christianity. <music> The objects from the Glendalough exhibition hold many clues and evidence of the arrival of Christianity in Ireland. Each object from this famous Christian site is a piece of a puzzle, which, when we look at it all together, can tell us about the people alive at the time, what they believed and how they lived. So, what can a piece of burnt wood and an early Christian handbell tell us about the buildings and the valley at Glendalough one and a half thousand years ago. We all know St. Patrick and St. Bridget, but Glendalough had its own saint, St. Kevin. According to the early Irish annals, he was born in Leinster and died in 618 AD. He was buried here in the valley and his grave became a very famous place of pilgrimage. The old Irish annals tell us that St. Kevin brought Christianity to this area. He left a monastery near Talla in Dublin, went into the wilds of the Glendalough Valley and started what would become a powerful and famous monastery. As the centuries passed, the annals had more and more elaborate tales of what he did, banishing monsters, carrying hot coals without being burnt and even turning cheese into stone. and legends sound very, very interesting. But when were they written down? Well, most of the stories about St. Kevin weren't written down till about at least 300 years after he had died. And then they were added to and added to and changed over time. So we can't really be sure exactly which are the earliest stories about him. Okay, well, what can archeology span tell us then about people who lived here in the time of St. Kevin? Well, most of the buildings, the church buildings in the valley, they don't date till maybe 500 years after St. Kevin was meant to have died. Mm -hmm. So really the earliest evidence was found actually behind us here at this, the Cahar, uh, 
uh, this stone circular monument where we found uh, a ditch around it and in that ditch was uh, charcoal. The same kind of charcoal that you'd use for a barbecue? Yeah, so burnt wood and the burnt wood was found along with bits of what's called slag or metalworking waste um, from making iron. And we know from early Irish laws that they were meant to have a sack of charcoal for making iron. This really early evidence um, it shows us that a blacksmith was working here at the Cahar at the time of St Kevin. So when they were using the charcoal back then, what kind of objects would the blacksmith have made? Well, the most important object that would have been made at an early monastic site would have been an iron bell. And we have one in our exhibition, which was found quite close to Glendalough in a place called Naka Temple. So the little piece of charcoal that we found in the ditch with the metalworking waste shows that there were people here connected with the working of metal at the time of St. Kevin. So it really is evidence then that Christianity was in the valley at that time. Yeah, it's the earliest evidence we have for people here during that time period. So what can we learn about Christianity and the past from looking at objects? Often, we learn a lot about our past from the artwork on these objects. The early Christian styles combine the earlier Celtic styles with woven strands called interlace often containing many interwoven beasts and birds and mythical creatures. They were used to decorate books, like the Book of Kells, stone crosses, and also metal objects. So the most famous is this, the Arda Chalice. It's a silver cup which was used in the Christian Mass, and it was found in a place near Arda in County Limerick by two boys digging for potatoes. It shows all a whole range of decorative techniques that were used in, in early medieval period, early Christian period in the 8th century, including glass, amber, quartz, silver and gold wire. And the gold wire is threaded for a band of strange creatures with interlocking arms and legs, which depict scenes from the Bible. And this is probably the finest example of early Christian art. Great monasteries like Glendalough um, accumulated wealth and they sought to hire craftsmen to make beautiful objects. And we have one of them here today in, in the case, um, this beautiful gilt mount. And it's a small piece of metal, beautiful interlaced design, copper alloy, but it's made to look like gold, so it's gilt. And it was part of a horse harness they would have been working both in metal and in stone. So there's a beautiful cross also, the marker cross, which is in another style called Hiberno Ernest style, so as a Viking influence style of art from a little bit later. But this object is from around the same time as the Arda Chalice. Okay, and relics, I mean, are the greatest evidence we have of all the artwork that was done, I suppose, in early Christian Ireland. We have um, the beautiful St. Patrick's Bell Shrine. We even have a shrine of St. Lockton's arm. And a relic is, of course, anything that can be associated with a saint. Um, it can be something they used or wore, um, or it can be part of their body. And of course, they're enshrined in these beautiful uh, casings of gold and silver and beautiful metalwork. But are there any relics from Glendalough? Because of a series of um, events, perhaps things like there were three different Viking raids at Glendalough, and then after that, later on in the, in the later medieval period, Glendalough became abandoned, and maybe its relics were um, put away and taken away from Glendalough. But we know they were there, because in 790, um, we know that the relics were taken on a tour um, of the territory which Glendalough, the monastery, controlled. But the closest thing that we have from Glendalough that is an actual artefact of evidence of what might have been there is probably this plaster cast that we can see here. So it's a cast made of a stone that's in Glendalough over a doorway. And what it shows is an abbot and then it's got a bishop on the other side who both would have been living at Glendalough and they're holding two objects. The abbot is holding a handbell, which we've seen already. So a really old sign of the, of the church's power. Mm -hmm and the bishop is holding a crozier, which is kind of a crooked staff covered in all kinds of beautiful ornament. And we have many of them here in the museum. 
Neither of these objects survive for Glendalough, but we have references to them and we know that they were there. It's really hard to make that out on the stone mat. I mean, were there other ways that the site was recorded? Because I suppose the weather has worn away the stone an awful lot. Well, what we're very lucky is that from the 18th century onwards, artists were going to Glendalough and they were recording the details on the stonework. So before this stone was broken, someone else uh, recorded the complete stone. Someone then recorded it again in the 19th century and again at the end of the 19th century. So using those and the plaster cast, we can piece together what this stone looked like. And we think it might have been over the building that was used to contain the relics, a place called the Priest's House okay. in Glendalough. Glendalough is really popular with hikers and ramblers. They might come here for a two or three hour walk around the lakes and the mountain ridges. The pilgrims, however, it might have taken them two to three weeks to get here. And the early Irish annals tell us that Glendalough was at least a one day's walk from civilization. So who was coming and why were they coming? Many different people came here some were very religious and came from far away and would have travelled across the sea to get here. Others may have been seeking refuge or to connect with God. We know this from some objects we have found at Glendalough. This cross was discovered during recent excavations in the valley of Glendalough. It's made of a material called jet and jet is found in Whitby in England. So it might have been worn by a monk who's maybe coming on pilgrimage to the valley. But I think you said others were coming to Glendalough as well. So apart from priests, bishops, abbots and nuns, you would also, there's evidence in historical sources for quite important people, um, local and regional kings who were coming to stay at Glendalough, probably making up for the lives they'd led, maybe of violence and looking for forgiveness for their sins in their final years at, at Glendalough. There are other objects then in the exhibition which kind of illustrate how far people might have come and the objects that came with them. And one in particular, beside the Jack Cross, is a piece of a, a tile made out of a stone called porphyry. So porphyry comes from the Eastern Mediterranean and it's used in Roman buildings. Um, and we know that in uh, Rome now, you had the Pope and his authority extended throughout Europe. And in Northern Europe, bits of these stone tiles are, were seen to have been given to maybe missionaries. And those missionaries then were sent out all over Europe to different places. And we find them in Ireland in some quite remote places, including right up on this rock at Temple Neskelic in this house where we found this piece of tile. So during early Christian times, people were beginning to go on pilgrimages to many places, some long distances, but some maybe short as well. And we also have a shoe from the valley from Lugduff. We think from the size of the shoe, from looking at it, that it might have been worn by a woman. It's only a size four. And we think there were many women coming to the valley as well. That's right. And un unfortunately, the, the written sources for women are, at Glendalough are quite poor. But obviously, this object shows that, that women were here. And we know that, that there were also powerful women here because we know that the uh, mother of a high king was actually um, went into retirement in Glendalough in probably in St Mary's or Our Lady's Church, which was a place where nuns lived. And apart from coming to pray, there were other reasons that people were coming to Glendalough. Well, some people would have actually been coming to Glendalough um, to seek safety or sanctuary. Um, Glendalough would have been surrounded by a big ditch uh, or moat, um, and it would have had a gatehouse. And once you were within that, you were safe from the law of outside. And we know from a lot later in the late medieval period that uh, a man who murdered his son was sent on a tour of the most holy places in Ireland to do penance for his sins. And one of those places was St Kevin's Bed in Glendalough. Unlike today, people in the medieval period would have rarely left their home place. 
So when they wanted to journey to monasteries like Glendalough, they would have followed stone crosses like these. Two important examples are in the National Museum. One, called the Labyrinth Stone, has a network of passages which look like a maze. The other one we have is a concrete cast of a cross which stood on St. Kevin's Way. The cross on this cast is very unusual and looks exactly like the one on a pin which was found at Temple Neskelig behind us here in an excavation in the 1950s. All these objects, the jet cross, the shoe, the tile, and the stone crosses show us that medieval Christians came to the valley from near and far. There were lots of hungry pilgrims then coming over the mountains looking to be fed and there was no McDonald's back then so we need another way of feeding them I suppose the monasteries did and the biggest object that we have in the exhibition and it of course tells us about the food they ate is this beautiful cauldron and it is quite a spectacular cauldron I know it's from later on in the time of the valley but something like this would have been used to feed all the pilgrims the monks the priests um, who were there what kind of food would they have ate? So this, this kind of vessel would be used to make something called pottage, um, which is kind of a mixture of uh, grain, something like um, stock, and then maybe, if they were lucky, bits of meat and vegetables mixed in. So a kind of a, a, kind of a stew, and it's a typical uh, diet in the, in the later medieval period. And I suppose the ingredients for this stew, we have evidence for that as well. I think we have some grains here. Yeah, so, so we have uh, both oat and barley in the exhibition, some charred oat and barley, which would have come from the excavations. Uh, we've also evidence for a millstone at the site. So a mill, milling is something that came in uh, with Christian monasteries uh, and mills were used to produce grain, flour um, and render uh, cereal. Okay, and it wasn't just food, it was also drink, of course, in the valley, and we have some pottery here, some very expensive pottery that would have been imported. This jug comes from Bristol, and it's a ceramic jug, and it would have been used to serve wine or potentially water. Okay, it's very pretty, and I suppose we have this in the handling collection in the museum. I think it's, you know, around the same time period, the same um, handle on it, but yeah. would it have been something like this? Something like that, except it shows a hunting scene. So it's got a, uh, just the edge of someone's hand holding a big long wooden club. They might have been blowing a horn and chasing something, a stag or something like that, on the original pot before it broke. So we're getting lots of evidence then around food in the valley, but what do you think about early Christianity? then in food, what's well, the big change? Well, we know that the whole idea of the monastery, the sto early stories of St. Kevin talk about how he went into a wild place and made it um, really fertile so that cows were well fed, um, cereals grew. So the idea of a monastery um, was that it was provisioned with, uh, that people were bringing food to it from outside, from the other churches. The introduction of Christianity meant um, that monasteries completely changed the way that food production was organised in Ireland. <laughs> By the 8th century, Glendalough was getting busy, not just with the pilgrims walking here, but also with the dead. It was called the Cemetery of the Western World in 780 AD, and it was said that its graveyard was getting really crowded. So what can we learn from how people are buried? Well, by looking at gravestones around us here and the valley, we can see that people have been buried here for over a thousand years and they're still buried here today. With the arrival of Christianity, how people were buried changed. We see the burial of an individual, and we see the burial of the body so that they're facing east-west, they're gonna face Jerusalem. If you were rich enough, you might get a gravestone marking where they were buried, with their names carved on it, so that they would be remembered. Further up the valley, there's a church, and really important people would have been buried up there. It's associated with regional kings and queens, Ordinary people might have been buried with no marker, but we can still see graves all around us today and we still have that practice of having our names inscribed on the gravestones. With the arrival of Christianity, we see a gradual changing in writing styles as well. 
This stone behind me is over 1500 years old and on it we see Ogham or own writing. And that style of writing is very Irish and is used for writing Irish family names. But with Christianity, we see a move on manuscripts, but also on those gravestones. And it can be seen here on the stone as well to the Roman or Latin alphabet. So in Glenda Lock, we actually have over a hundred of those gravestones from that early Christian period requesting uh, prayers to be said. And the gravestones have on them in that Latin writing, the names of the people who died. So, like today, a bell would have been rung when someone was being buried. In the beginning, this was a handbell, like we saw in the exhibition. But as bells changed, so did the design of the buildings. The earliest churches at Glendalough would have been wooden, but over time they were replaced by stone churches, and there are seven of them still surviving in Glendalough. You might notice the small circular tower at the back of this church. This was used to carry a suspended bell. There is also a bigger freestanding tower called a round tower, or in Irish, cligchoc, which means bell house, but we're not sure what kind of bell was rung in it. The suspended bell that we have in the exhibition is made of copper alloy, and it would have been bought from somewhere in Northwestern Europe to be suspended in this bell tower. It would have been bought at great expense, probably through the port of Dublin, sometime in the 11th century. And it would have been rung continuously during funeral services here at Glendalough. Today, when we're at a loose end, we play games on our phone, or maybe a board game. This is a modern version of Nine Men's Morris, a game that's been around for over 1,200 years. A stone found at Glendalough with scratch markings on it was probably a version of this game. Board games are found at a lot of monastic sites, and they were a sign of a good education. Sorry, <laughs> board game was probably scratched quite quickly into the stone by two monks who were trying to pass the time. We know that monks did play board games and we have found board games at archaeological sites in Ireland and also small little gaming pieces of wood and bone. One of the places that we've also found a board game is down in County Kerry at the Skerlings, also a monastic site and it was one of the locations for the Star Wars films. But what other evidence do we have for education and learning at Glendalough? Well, as a young monk, you would have had to learn Latin, Greek, Hebrew, maths and philosophy and to write. You also would have been looked up to if you had a lot of knowledge. They were called lectors. We know that books were written at Glendalough because there's a book of complex maths and there's a little note in that book that records an abbot dying in Glendalough. You also, as a monk, would have had to practice your writing before you started writing any manuscripts. And you would have used something like this, a little wax tablet. As well as people coming here to learn, they also came here for power. The church and saints had a new wealth and influence over the population. And that wasn't to everyone's liking. The site of Glendalough then is yeah. becoming 
more powerful, more yeah. wealthy, uh, and that attracts other types of power. I suppose the regional kings mm -hmm. and even queens were interested in what was happening there within yeah. the site. We know even some of the families fought over the site of Glendalough. They would have wanted family members maybe to be an abbot, or they mm -hmm. might have wanted one of the powerful women in the family might become a widow and she might retire to Glendalough. Mm -hmm. And it was all about having a connection to this place that was seen as a place of power. Mm. So, I mean, this pin that you can see in front of you here, the, the round head and the beautiful decorated cross on it. Um, this probably belonged to a bishop and was part of their pall, which was a, a garment given to them as a sign of their office. So a piece of clothing put around their neck and fastened with these beautiful pins. And this one dates to the 11th century. One of the most significant uh, people associated that might have worn this kind of pin was a famous um, abbot called uh, Lawrence O'Toole, who later became a saint. Um, and in the beginning, he was abbot of Glendalough. Uh, he was eventually promoted to become Archbishop of Dublin. But we know that he came back to this little remote ledge at the upper lake in Glendalough, mm -hmm. um, and he prayed in the cave there, which is called St. Kevin's Bed. He's probably the most famous person um, who we know of other than St. Kevin associated with Glendalough. And his heart is actually kept in Christchurch Cathedral uh, in Dublin, which you can still see today. And I guess this is a sign of the growing power of Dublin. As we saw earlier with the gilt horse mount, Vikings came to Glendalough from early on. They would have first come to plunder the wealth and people, but as the Vikings began to settle in Ireland and Glendalough became more powerful, they began to trade with each other. We know this from three hordes of coins that have been found at Glendalough. So there was a lot of trading and connections going on between the monastic site and then the Viking city of Dublin. Yeah, so one, one of the most exciting objects that we have um, here in, in the exhibition is this silver coin, um, which is uh, a penny of King Citric, who was the Viking King of Dublin. Um, and it's the first Irish coinage, first coin to be minted in Ireland. And it, um, what's interesting about it is it actually has a, a cross on it. So it's an imitation of a coin used at the same time in England, but it's giving across that message um, that Christianity is now part of the trading system. Mm -hmm. um, and coins like this would be used in everyday uh, transactions in Glendalough. And then, of course, the people in Glendalough were also selling things mm. to the Vikings. Yeah. And we have one of the most unusual examples of this that comes from Denmark, the home of the Vikings. And the reason we have this evidence is it's ship's timbers, the timbers yeah. of a ship. And the wood came from the monastic site mm. of Glendalough, but would have been traded to the Vikings and then would have been used by them to make a ship that was sailed to Denmark. And we have such good evidence about that ship that they recreated one. They made a replica, which is called the Sea Stallion from Glendalough. Then, of course, after that time, the Vikings gradually became a part of local politics mm -hmm. and they became allied with local kings and they were used to fight one side against another. Uh, and Dublin became an increasingly important town and gradually there was a fight over which centre would become the, the, the ruling part of the church. And eventually um, Dublin won out in a kind, of, uh, a kind of a game of thrones. So I suppose Glendalough becomes a rebel, it becomes a, called a mm. den of thieves and robbers. That's right, and that's what one bishop said about Glendalough. Um, but of course, that was kind of fake news because we know from um, archaeological evidence, from things that you've seen already, the cauldron, the pot, um, coin, a coin hoard, all of these things are showing us that Glendalough was very much alive um, even after the bishop was no longer sitting there anymore. Today, the valley is famous as a national park and people from all over the world visit to see the scenery and the two beautiful lakes. And all the stories of powerful struggles and of those who lived there in the past are hidden in the valley. We only have the legends of the annals, the remains of the buildings, and a few objects left. So we've shown how by looking at these objects, 
the buildings and the landscape in the valley that we can understand what happened here in the past. And thanks to archaeology, how this simple piece of charcoal helps unlock the start of the story of early Christianity here in the monastery at Dandelion.